Now isn't this two days in a row? <laughs> you should see him like football. Every day. Okay, you know, I know you have to talk to your teacher in the middle of a quiz yesterday, but you gotta get here. Be a star. <laughs> Stream. It's streaming. Okay, good. Don't go off. Okay. So, what is Tuesday? So don't forget. Test. Test. That's I know. I mean, it's good you got to pass for your math teacher, but the second day in a row from there, so we just got to get to class. We have a test on Tuesday. Don't forget, short IDs, you must log on. What time must you log on to the computer? It's your team. Huh? 5 a.m. Be there at 5 a.m. If I'm not there, I'll be there. And then we'll go over everything at 5 a.m. Just wait for me if I'm not there. Wait for me. I promise I'll be there. About five hours later. Okay, you know, time is irrelevant. All that matters is that you're ready for the test. Now, what time? Uh, 1027. You'll be there at 1025. I'll turn it on. You have to have a camera on. Sound good? And... Yeah, don't worry. It'd be weird seeing people without a mask. Huh? Well, then you could just put the nuts right there and go. Yeah, that would look suspicious. I'm just breathing. Yeah, just trying to breathe at home. Okay, so you just got to do it. But uh, the test, and I know it's going to be weird and awkward. It just, it's, hey, it's our world. Especially now that. Uh, as we were talking in the class began, our president has this. And it seems to be spreading with people who are at seeing him. There was a big fundraiser and there were people shaking hands with him. Uh, they're going to have to do checks of, and they did no social distancing, no masks. And masks is the thing, the number one thing. If people, both people, if two people wear a mask, it's 80, if one of them has COVID, the chance of contracting it is dropped by 80%. Both people wear masks. So masks are the key. And uh, yes, I hate them too. I know. Uh, and that'd be just regular masks. I don't mean the, uh, what is it, the, the N94 mask. I don't know. I got my numbers right. 95. Well, I like 94. A little thinner, more aerodynamic. Better for running. Yeah, you're right, 95. And so we're, it's going to be, let me just put it this way. This next month, these next six weeks are going to be crazy. Yes. Absolutely crazy. And prepare yourself for one thing. If you think that you're going to, um, there's a chance that on election day there'll be a decision, but the odds are there won't be because there's already well over, well over a million people now have voted early. And that number is going to be a record number. And so it's going to be a long time to count. So it's going to be nuts. You know, it was so boring and blase when I was your age. There's nothing. You got pandemics, you got economic crisis, <laughs> you, uh, got, you got near deflation, you got massive forest fires, you got the ice, the uh, um, the glaciers all melting. All I had was the Soviet Union. Yes. I know. It will and hundred years from now people think it's a work of dystopian fiction. Oh yeah, well we all have racism. Yeah, we all have racism. That's a constant. Alright, so we'll get to the Supreme Court that they ruled that racism doesn't exist anymore. That's another story, two thousand eleven. So with that, we got some new strategy. What battle brought the French into the war? And if you ever get a chance, Saratoga. Yeah, that part of New York, wow, is it pretty. It's the Finger Lakes and the Lake Champlain. It's kind of mind-boggling. It's not like Eastern Montana. And, <laughs> and the French got into the war. And who else entered the war after the French got into it? The Chinese. Yeah. To the British point of view, pretty much. Well, they were, oh, who, who led the Mohawks? Uh, Joseph. Uh, even though it's more complex than that, Grant did it. Joseph. Who was the American co uh, commander who got the claim to the Ohio River? Yeah, Clark. And his famous brother? Louis. Louis Clark. Clark. <laughs> and uh, what else? Yeah, there was, there was a lot of stuff here. I mean, that's a big ship. Spain and the Netherlands also knew the war. 
Okay, they all jumped in and attacked the British. And so the British became a worldwide war. Did we get to this? I don't know. We just we yeah. ended on this one. Oh, we got, so I showed you this and this, yeah. right? Yeah. yeah. So right here, Southern Strategy. So the Southern Strategy, oh yeah, this is exactly where we put it. So, yeah, first part slightly ahead, but we're going to work out fine. British are in New York. Uh, basically, they pulled out of Pennsylvania, and they're, oh, Benedict Arnold, what fort did he try to, did he attempt to give away? West Point. Yeah. And that was a civil war in Virginia. Oh, yeah, they're the best. The British kept their main base in New York, and what they decided was this. They're more loyalists in the South. There's a more loyalist feeling in the South. At least that's what they thought. They tried to take Charleston and were repelled in 1775, but they thought this time we'll go back to Charleston, and then they'll move north and go sweep away all the patriots. That's called pacify. And at least control the South. And that would isolate New England. And so they're thinking, okay, we've got a wider war. Let's make sure we lease all the South. Just in case we can't bring these people back in, we still hold the area with the tobacco plantations, etc. So that was their plan. Now, they totally misread the situation. There were more loyalists in the South because there were no British in the South. There weren't people burning their farms down and stealing their food and occupying their homes. They were up here. You send an army down here, and what will you create? Exactly. And so the Southern strategy was based on a false premise that, by the way, every country that goes into a war like this will repeat. And they all think, well, this time we know better, and then do the same thing. By the way, what do you call somebody who does the same thing over and over again and expect a different outcome? Fortunately, the United States, who benefited from this, would never do this, yeah. except for all the wars like this that we'll be in. Because everybody thinks we're better and we won't do it. So they did in Vietnam. They did it in the Philippines in the 1900s, early 1900s. They did it in, in your lifetime, Iraq and Afghanistan. So Charleston in 1780 would fall. I know I skip, I skip a few things, but Charleston would fall. This was actually kind of a really amazing battle. It was a fight around Savannah. They kind of looped around and got Charleston. The Americans were totally humiliated in Charleston. They should have retreated. Their commanding officer, Benjamin Lincoln, uh, couldn't hold the city, but he allowed his army to be captured. I mean, just a, a series of mistakes. Charleston right here. By the way, it's still called Charlestown. It become Charleston after the war because we don't want a town named after some British king. Which it's still Charles in it, but whatever. That's not as bad. And this map showed you pretty much what happened, right? I don't even need to tell you anymore. That easy to follow map should pretty much sum it up. Yep. Clear as day. I got that. That was kind of funny. So that's from the West Point Atlas. Um, yeah. But you know what? It has arrows on it. <laughs> yeah. And I sleep at night. I'm comforted with the knowledge that somewhere there are maps with arrows on them. So with that, the British are here. The thing is, there's still patriots out there. And so how do you get them? How do you move north? Well, the new colonial militia was organizing around the center of South Carolina. So the British decide to advance out of Charleston and defeat them. And we're coming up to the first big battle in the South, August 1780, the Battle of Camden, which is right in the central part, central plains of South Carolina, just starting to get out of the swampy area near the coastline. And as the British advance into South Carolina, they're going further and further away from their supplies. Anybody want to guess what kind of roads there were in colonial America in 1780? Yeah, major, like the Autobahn, pretty much. Just a couple of wagon ruts. That's it. So with that, the Continental Commander, I'll say these based on Cont Gates, the Continental General's Gates, the same commander at, at Saratoga. And he had about 10,000 men, but virtually all of them were militia. The British general was one of their best 
officers, in fact, still considered one of the best officers in British military history, Lord Cornwallis. And Cornwallis had more men, and Cornwallis also knew, to his point of view, we defeat them, this is what he, he thinks he knows, we defeat them, the Patriot cause is destroyed, and it'll be a triumphant march into Virginia. And he knows it, we're, we're experienced soldiers, and they're militia. And so, both sides lined up and fought. Now the thing was, Gates did not protect his flanks, Cornwallis hit his flanks. So basically, Gates was like this, and Cornwallis came around him with part of his army. And when Gates saw this, Gates was in the center line with most of his militia. He saw the British coming around to his left, and what did he do? No, ran away. He mounted his horse and ran away as fast as he could go. Just ran away. And once the militia in the center, who the British were starting to advance in the center to, saw that, what did they do? They left. Gone. And it was a disaster. The Battle of Camden was a horrible defeat. The only reason the entire army was not destroyed is that they ran faster than the British could follow. Needless to say, though, finally Gates is gone. He would lose his command, and Washington would finally get overall command. This was trying to be a big deal. They finally had to accept it. <laughs> so here is, I like this shot, the militia running. <laughs> yeah, I'm out of here. But sure, they lost, but there's still patriots everywhere. Cornwallis was kind of shocked. Couldn't believe it. Why do they keep fighting? And so this would turn into the beginnings of a disaster because of their supply lines. They had to bring supplies all the way from Charleston, but there's virtually no roads. So ammunition and a few food, a, a, a few food parcels could come, but most of the time they had to do what's called foraging. Foraging means what? Going down to the woods. Sending wagons and cavalry and troops out to the farms and take their food. Liberate. Yeah, liberate, good word. Take their food that they've been storing for the winter. During the war, especially these subsistence, small subsistence farmers like this, subsistence farmers like this, they needed that food to survive the winter. And the British would come through and steal their food. And if they resisted, as this picture shows in the background, you resist, we burn your farm, your, your farm, your barns down. We destroy it. Here is a very stylized picture of a colonial woman trying to stand up to the British coming to take her food. And some people would be hurt, but the big thing is they destroy your farm. Burn everything down and still take everything. Now the British are thinking, all right, this will terrorize them. They'll know we mean business and they'll just give us the food. But what are they actually creating? Patriots, Patriots everywhere. Everywhere. And there's a problem. What does a Patriot look like? Like yeah, they're not walking around saying, I love the United States, waving the Betsy Ross flag over there. They look like loyalists. They look like people are neutral. And the British can't tell. And soon you have more patriots. They start going out at night. And what's the tactics called? The hit and run? Gorilla. Like this right here, hitting a British supply line, guerrilla tactics. And they go back to their farms. I love Britain. And then that night they go attack. How do you know who the enemy is? And so the British would start doing whatever there's a guerrilla attack. They would destroy every farm or little village nearby as a reprisal with the assumption, OK, that those farms must be helping the guerrillas. Thus creating more patriots. And every time this happens in wars like this, the British don't have enough men to hold everywhere, so all they can use is terror. That's all they can use. But that creates more patriots. And when the British would march through, who would filter in behind? Patriots. Yes. It's really hard to fight a war like this. This is called, guerrillas are called insurgents. So an army fighting an insurgent war would be counterinsurgency. Makes sense? So for counterinsurgency, Military doctrine is you need 10 soldiers to fight one guerrilla. 
10 to 1. Because gorillas can attack everywhere. Does that make sense then? They didn't have near 10 to 1. But every country down the road will think, we got enough. <laughs> we're, we're smarter. And then they don't have enough. The American Indians did not have enough. They were off number. A lot. So that's one of the reasons why they would be beaten in a war like this. They can be beaten, but it's really hard. Very expensive. Remember what I told you. The, eventually they'll decide we've had enough. And so the most famous of these gorillas was the swamp fox. Francis Marion. I love this statue of him. I just think this is cool. Um, here, this is kind of a neat picture of them hiding behind the, the trees. And this, uh, it's just kind of a funny little water pillar out of your way. And uh, I just like that picture. And that's uh, in South Carolina. You go to Charleston, you see that. And they would use hit and run tactics, go back into the swamps and hide. If you've ever seen the, the horrifically uh, awful movie called The Patriot with Mel Gibson, it's loosely based upon the swamp fox. <laughs> yeah, I'm not a Mel Gibson fan, but uh, that movie is so silly. And one thing you have to add, Francis Marion was a plantation owner. And his anger against the British was not just the fact that the British were attacking and stealing their food, it's that the British were offering what? Freedom, Freedom, for, slaves. Freedom for slaves. And so here you have people fighting for freedom because they wanted to keep slaves. Contradictions abound in American history, in every country's history, you know. Even Canada. So it's that. <laughs> but it's a, that's a good point. And that, this is near Charleston. There's statues of Francis Marion all over. So. Washington would put his best general now in command of the South. Now Washington's command. His best general, the fighting Quaker, Nathaniel Green. What's ironic about just the term fighting Quaker, let alone his best general being a Quaker? Yeah, they're pacifists. But as he saw, if we're going to fight for a society based upon freedom, i got to fight. And he would turn out to be the best. Maybe because he so abhorred the war, the fighting, but he felt had to, he had to do it. He's one of the greatest generals in American military history. And a real contradiction to what you think about generals and they want to put this heroic figure. So, and I, I, I like Nathaniel Green as his commanders go. You know, notice the picture? Old lady. Did it kind of look like an elderly lady? That's what they do? Because they soften the features? That's even the double chin. Say it again. They gave him a double chin. Yeah, I think they had it. Yeah. Uh, and remember, he was probably he was getting older with it. That's actually uh, taken in. Or the, taken. <laughs> they, they take a, a full, uh, painting. Uh, 1790s. So he's a little older. But he avoided major fights. And the British did come, they just retreated. And he continued and supported the guerrilla attacks on the supply lines. And his plan was retreat more into the interior. So retreat into South Carolina, and Cornwallis has to follow. Longer supply lines, more enemies. Clever, isn't it? And fight only. Green would only fight any kind of battle, only fight when he wanted to. He would pick the battlefield. So you can imagine what Cornwallis is thinking. They won't fight. They won't fight. So if I see them, if they're there, what is Cornwallis? He feels he has to do what? If he seeds green. Attack. attack now. Can't wait. Attack. Because if I don't attack, they retreat. And so this makes him very rash. And his men are desperate and tired and, and, and on edge all the time because a guerrilla attacks. The most famous battle in Montana was the Battle of the, of the Little Bighorn. And that is what Lieutenant Colonel Custer made that decision. As he saw it, I have to attack. If not, they'll leave. Now, that would turn out to be a shockingly foolish attack. But that's why he made that attack, which appears so rash and insane. And so, here are the soldiers. And I just put this up here to give you an idea of what they look like. I thought this was kind of neat. So the British soldiers, mostly red. A lot of the cavalry and elite forces wore green. Remember, the brightly colored uniforms were just to see them through the black smoke. Green's army, look at the hodgepodge of things they have. 
whatever clothing they had, deer skin, whatever. And you also notice some blue, red, they stole off the British. Yeah, they just, they, especially in the winter, they took the British stuff. Whenever you see pictures of the Confederacy, and it's like a painting during the Civil War, and they'll show them like in gray or kind of brown. Same thing, hodgepodge of clothes and a lot of blue, because they would still, especially overcoats from the Union Army. And so we're coming up to a couple reversals that the British are going to have. Just two months after Camden, an elite British regiment, Tarleton's Re Legion, that were masters of, at least they thought they were masters of fighting that same guerrilla war and running down the guerrillas in the swamps, and up in western South Carolina at a place called Kings Mountain, Tarleton's Legion, they wore red, I'm sorry, did I say red? They wore green. They wore red, but disguised it with green. <laughs> they wore green. They were surprised by, okay, it shows, it. this is supposed to be the battle, and it shows him with buckskin on, deerskin. They were ambushed in the mountains of western South Carolina. And this really, really thick force, you get an idea how thick it is. You don't rain a lot more than here, so trees are just everywhere. All kinds of undergrowth. What happened was Tarleton's legion was looking for guerrillas and foraging. And out of the woods came pouring all these hill folk, hillbillies, came out of the forest. There was a real organized attack. Heck, most of them, they didn't like the government in South Carolina and didn't even care what country they are in. They just wanted to be left alone. But they attacked and ambushed the British and defeated an elite regiment. And these were just mountain men with hunting rifles. They could get away with it because of the heavy forest. Then, in January 1781, actually relatively close, at a little village called Calpin. Gee, I wonder how they got that name. Must have been a chicken coop. But they would name them after whatever. You see things in the South would be like named after a tavern or a courthouse. There's not very many towns in the South. Well, then the one. The, a small American force of about 1,000 men defeated another force, including Tarleton. This is a picture of the continental, excuse me, militia. At Calpin, used in a South Peace battle, in a flat field. This was not an ambush. It was Daniel Morgan, one of the heroes of Saratoga. He was very ill. He was elderly by then, so this would be his last battle, but won a victory here. The point is, they're still in the fight. Even after Camden, they're still fighting. And Cornwallis is getting desperate, and um, Gage retreats into North Carolina. Cornwallis comes after him, leaving more patriots. <coughs> and we're coming to the big battle. The Battle of Guilford Courthouse. March, it's March 15, but March 1781. So it's still cold, wet ground, and green decides the battlefield. First off, if you see this right here, this pretty much sums it up, doesn't it? Yeah. yeah. At least I'm comforted. There's lots of arrows here. I think there could be more couple lines. You're right. Come on, don't be chintzy on the arrows. But, that flag, see the flag right there? That's the Guilford Courthouse flag. The Continental Army knew the flag of the United States had 13 stripes, which had been used for the Stamp Act Congress for eight and 13, had 13 stripes, had a field then with 13 stars. And they knew it was red, white, and blue, copying the Union Jack. That's all they knew. So you look over there, that is the Betsy Ross flag. She probably has nothing to do with it, but that's what we call it. The circle with the stars, there is no set pattern, so the stars could be in any shape. In fact, that's why the flag next to the Guilford Courthouse one, that's a Civil War era. You see stars, you know, sometimes we make all kinds of shapes. It'd be the 1880s when they, um, after Montana became the state, actually. Just Montana, that changed everything. Yeah. They were running out of room, so they had to set where the stars were. So, red, white, and blue, 13 stripes, stars. 
That's all they do. I think that's a really cool flag. I really like that flag. Uh, I think the United States, has, I, I like the American flag. Um, Union Jack's pretty cool. You gotta admit the flag of Wales is absolutely amazing. Yeah, just, it's just amazing. Nepal, Nepal has a cool flag. Nepal does have a new, uh, and uh, yeah, there's a lot of cool flags. Wales, but that is a really neat flag. Well, I can't, I gotta draw you a map. There it is. So to really understand what happened there, think about this flat field. And you can still see the remnants of uh, first period here. But I have to draw it because First off, I like to show off my cartography skills. I'm a natural born map maker. What can I say? Who is that? Huh? Who is that? No. <laughs> and don't be jealous. I was born with these skills. I'm jealous. And you're very humble about it, too. I, have you noticed? It takes a humble person to brag about their skills. But Green can pick the battlefield because he knows Cornwallis will attack wherever he picks. So he picked a broad, flat field that looked very flat, but it was deceptive. But on both sides was heavy forest. So his flanks would be protected. So the larger British army couldn't go around. And so, imagine this is the field. Right, we got the field. These, this is forest. How do we know it's forest? Because it's green. <laughs> Not only that, but there's forest animal in there. Can you see them? Yeah. There's a deer. Deer. Can you draw a squirrel? Badger. Squirrel. Yes. Land walrus. <laughs> no land walrus. The whole field. There'd just be giant herds of land walrus crossing the plains. It's like, like bison. And uh, what else do we have? Oh, wildebeest. What about T-Rexes? That big, giant pig animal. Feral pigs. Okay, so with that, but in the middle of the field, barely, um, you can barely perceive it if you're here, was a small rise. That's my rise. So kind of like this. And so anybody here couldn't see here. And Green, he did what Morgan did at Calpins at a wider scale. He put his militia, two lines of militia here. And then had, he had about 9,000 troops. He took half of them, or most of them were militia. But he did have trained soldiers. He put back here, and they took a knee. Actually, they laid down. Did you get that? So they could, the British who were here couldn't see him. And what do militia always do? And so his strategy was to have the militia fire, so stand your ground fire two rounds, and then run away. And then run. The British are going to line up here. And Cornwallis' plan, march to 50 paces, fire a volley, fix bayonets, and go. Because we can't let them get away. And then in the trees are going to be snipers. Men with hunting rifles. They can't fire fast. That's snipers. They disguise themselves as blue dots. And they would take pot shots at the British and disrupt them. And it worked exactly, at least at first, like Green One. The British marched here, they fired, the militia fired two rounds, and then did exactly what Cornwallis expected. Gone. They took off running. And here they go running full speed over the rise, screaming in panic. The British were ordered to fix bayonets and charge. But can you imagine how the British soldiers, they've been marching and fighting and angry for months, and finally they can get them. So what did they do? They just took off sprinting over this round, over this hill, with their bayonets, and lost their organization. You know, they just come in full speed, ah, and they get them. We get a stick up. They came over the ridge, and Green had his Continentals, the trained soldiers, stand up and fire right in their face. It took them totally by surprise. The British tried to organize their lines, but they couldn't. And soon the British went retreating over the hill. <laughs> but 
This is where Green's plan began to fail. The Continentals are like, we got them! And what did they do? Chase them. They chased after them. And when they went over, this turned into a giant melee. That's my picture of a melee. A confused battle. Cornwallis is watching this, and he's going, oh, no. <laughs> what have I done? If he loses out there, it'll be like Saratoga. And he could lose now. He could lose. He might have to surrender because he's surrounded in enemy territory, hostile territory. And so he has 30 cannon. They're lined up back here. He orders his cannoneers to load their cannon with this. Anybody know what grape shot is? Yes. What's grape shot? It's just like tiny cannonballs, so they spread out. It's like a shotgun. They literally have bags. They would stick them in the can of like 9 to 12 cannonballs this size. So one big cannonball that might have a little gunpowder in it, but one big cannonball, nine, sometimes 12. Yeah, what happens when you fire that? <laughs> Imagine what that would do to bodies. He had his cannon fire right into the melee, including into his own men. He was desperate, and we had to, he could not be defeated. Yeah? I don't think I can see. Could you draw the cannons at this point? <laughs> you know, I've drawn. I don't want to show them off. <laughs> but what would happen? Green, realizing the melee has kind of lost control, he called retreat. And the Continental Army pulled back, and Cornwallis was left at the battlefield. A third of his men dead or killed, killed or wounded. He tactically, in the short term, won. But in the long term, which is called strategic, a horrible defeat. Because he can't stay there. And this would turn the tide of the southern, uh, the last British gasp. Just like Saratoga, in many ways, would turn the tide. Trenton, here's another one. Green didn't necessarily win. He didn't win the battle, but won the war. Cornwallis would have to retreat to the sea. It, amazing tactics. If you watch The Patriot with Mel Gibson, and I might make you watch it if you continue to be mean to me, but they have this battle, and then it ends with a big sword fight. It's pretty funny. But, so, Cornwallis would have would fled to the sea. He had no choice. Here's Guilford Courthouse. He goes to the sea, Wilmington, gets supplies, and then goes into Virginia. And for the next two months, we're fighting that Civil War, that summer. By the end of summer, he realizes that it's not working. The British have to reevaluate their entire battle plan. But, where are we at here? Green didn't follow. Green went back into South Carolina and went village by village and drove the Loyalists out. Green would liberate. That's why if you go to all these southern towns in North Carolina and South Carolina, there's a statue of Green. And that's why Green would be one of the heroes. He knew Cornwallis is gone. We tech the South. We survived and reconquered. A brilliant victory. And then the southern strategy, therefore, disaster is not strong enough of a word. A total and complete failure. Cornwallis would eventually have to retreat to the sea. In fact, he would decide he's going to go to this little place called Yorktown. He's going to go to Yorktown. And that's where we get to September, I'm sorry, October. Actually, it's September and October. We're just saying October 1781, the Battle of Yorktown. And this would be the last decisive battle, last battle of the war. Big battle. Cornwallis retreated to Yorktown, which is right across the James Peninsula from, remember Jamestown? So it's very, very historical part. And Washington, he's not there. <coughs> Washington is keeping an eye at the main British garrison around New York. The British have 30,000 troops in New York. And Washington, he gets word that Cornwallis is on the, in this little peninsula. And he realizes, what if I can bottle him up and force a, uh, force a surrender? This could end it. Washington's a gambler. Remember Trenton. He takes risks. 
And so he, using the very popular term of the time, still used today, but it's dice games are really popular, he rolled the die. He gambled. He decided to risk everything and march down to Yorktown. A huge gamble. But he needs French aid. So they march to Yorktown with French help. He actually would have to go to the French commander, General Rochambeau. Yes. That, okay, he spilled a little bit, but still very impressive. Uh, bah, 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 bah. Let's give you paper towels. Right oh, you mean these things right in front of me? It happens. I'm still impressed with the catch, though. And so they march down. And here is a very stylized pa painting. At least Washington looks more like Washington would have looked like in 1781. And you notice the men with the uniforms? He had the few trained soldiers with uniforms that leading the way through villages as they go through New York and New Jersey. And then all the men, would, because most of them just had whatever they had. Yet the French, which made up over half of its army, they had tan and white uniforms and looked great and marched in step and looked like a real army, really humiliating the Continentals. In fact, how, or the French even infuriated them more because every morning after going on dirt roads and fording creeks and crossing rivers and going through mud, the French would look great. And their white pants and whitish tan uniforms always look clean. How did the French do it? <laughs> pre tide And you can't really clean, you can't wash white uni or uh, wool uniforms. With water on these. Hmm? Nope, good guess though. Yes, they had the most dangerous type. It infuriated the Continentals. How oh, they look so good? French soldiers had little pouches of talcum powder. And every night on the muddy spots, garbage? <laughs> every night they would take the talcum powder and sprinkle it on their uniform, pat it in, and so they looked white and clean. <laughs> but if you would have hit them, just poof, like a big puffball. But they marched down. And here's the thing, though. Can't the British, or I'm sorry, can't the British just use the Royal Navy and escape? They need the French fleet. And we're coming to what's called, they call it the Battle of Chesapeake Capes. There's even a battle map of it, but it really wasn't a battle. The French fleet agreed to come up from the Caribbean. <coughs> Remember those three Caribbean islands I told you about from the Treaty of Paris of 1763? Now, even know what a ship with a line is? It's a ship that's in the line. Yeah. Right. It's uh, a lot bigger than the frigates and had a lot more guns. Yeah. What we would call in the next century a battleship. And they might carry anywhere from 50 to 100 cannons. And they would line up in lines. And the tactics at the time were just like the infantry tactics. Ships would line up and blaze away at each other until ships started losing their mask, couldn't fire back, and then they would be either forced to surrender or they'd be boarded with naval infantry. That's what Marines are. And there were Marines in the mast shooting down at them. Which, by the way, those guys had to be crazy on one of those ships in a mast as it's going back and forth. I get a little kind of queasy just thinking about it. Ships are really top heavy because they have two or three decks of just cannon. But these are the big ships, ships of the line. The British and the French both had ships of the line in the Americas. The French just reinforced their fleet in, in Martinique. They had 24 ships of the line in the Caribbean. 24. The British, their fleet was split because remember New York? They had 19 in New York and 12 in the Caribbean. Actually, that's not right. Reverse that. I typed it in, and I know I typed it in, but I made a mistake. It was 19 in the Caribbean, 12 in New York. I just realized that. Yeah, you know, that goes on. But the big thing was the bell rang. I guess you'll never know what happened with the battle. And then they all went to the if, Please look at the review list. Please look at it. Send me questions. 
and I will finish this on my script. This Yorktown Treaty Paris when that was a war. I'll answer questions and remind you, but don't forget to tell what time you have to log in. John. 5 a.m. 5 a.m. Yes, 5 a.m. Can I take my quiz to Yeah. Thank you. Just remind me. Yeah. No, he's you just log in at the time. Uh -huh. I got you so tired. I made a mistake.